My name is Aaron Fischer. I am originally a mathematician, that is I was in math and academia for many years, or ending up with a PhD in algebraic topology. And uh, then I transitioned into working with Ethereum, that I was really excited about. And I'm now working with the Swarm team of the Ethereum Foundation and the Colony project as well. Fundamentally, no, I mean, nothing has changed on a fundamental level. There was a lot of craziness this year in terms of token sales and scams that go with it, and a lot of, you know, it wasn't, wasn't a lot of good attention. It, it got a little, um, you know, a little hectic at times, but um, it's, just, it's, very, it's exciting to see projects mature. So a lot of the older projects have been there since the beginning. Um, they're quietly and slowly progressing. And if you, you know, if you know what to look for, not don't look for the, the hype, and, and, uh, but look for the, the you know, long-term project, it's nice to see the ecosystem mature. The Byzantium hard fork, um, there's a lot of changes that went into that. You know, most users don't notice just how sophisticated it was and how amazing it was that we managed to do this hard fork and, and pulled off, it worked. And I'm very excited about what new possibilities that brings. Yeah, as for Swarm, so there's a lot been happening under the hood for Swarm. The public side, there was a release of our proof of concept client and people have been playing with it, but it's been plagued by a lot of performance bugs and just general bugs. And uh, instead of fixing them one by one, we realized that certain sections had to be completely rewritten. So a lot of that has been going on in the background. And then it spawned a lot of side projects, like there's the PSS communications protocol and um, well, that's just to name one, but we had a, our first Swarm Summit this summer in Berlin, which is a Swarm-specific conference and brought a lot of people together who are interested in this topic, and that was, that was a really great experience. At the summit, we discussed like, what needs to change in Swarm, but also what it could be used for and what is needed. There's uh, input also from Status about need for light clients, which we'd sort of been ignoring, but we have taken to heart, we really need light clients, but we have to define what does that even mean? Because there's light on storage and there's light on bandwidth. There, you know, some might, if you have, don't have a hard drive, but a good internet connection, you don't mind forwarding packets for others. But if you're on a limited data plan, you don't even want to do that. And then we had to figure out how does that kind of a light client fit into our routing network so that all data is still um, findable. And so that's one of the things we worked out at the summit. And I was also introduced to other projects that I didn't really know about, like LivePeer, who do video streaming over Swarm. And that was really cool. I was blown away that you could use our network for that. There are a lot of stuff is exciting, and sometimes you get excited by things you didn't expect. Um, like, I was really impressed by Peter's talk on uh, Puppeth, which all it is is a way to easily launch your own testnet. And, but that's really important if you want to test your own software. But what he actually managed to do on stage was launch his own testnet with his own Genesis block, launch a faucet, a web wallet, a block explorer, a, you know, network monitor, everything. And the, to see like all these different ingredients that had already existed before come together in a neatly packaged way, I mean, that, that, that was great. I mean, it shows the maturing of the ecosystem. Um, but it made me want to launch my own testnet, even though I don't need one. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I think we're gonna see a, a lot of tentative launches on mainnet of, of actual the DApps that we've been waiting for for a long time. Um, starting with things like micro Raiden. I mean, it's relatively simple still, but launch on mainnet is still a big step. Having instant micro payments. And that, of course, ties into a lot of the IoT stuff, which was a you know, part of the original hype for blockchains, and this makes it a, brings it closer to reality. And it's the same as they've always been. I mean, the, the main challenges are, for the blockchain side, scalability, which, and with it comes cost. Like right now, it's too slow and too expensive to do things. But also, um, security. Um, we are not good at securing our phones or our laptops, and there's really not much precedent for having to secure files as well as we now have to secure our wallet files, and and we see that by you know all these exploits and phishing attacks. 
Um, so that is a big hurdle to adoption um, because also a lot of people are going to get hurt along the way. Yeah, so that's an ease of use thing. So it, it, right now it's hard to use, but it has to be hard because anything that makes it easy often also tends to compromise your security. I mean, it's nice to see things like hardware wallets get more widespread because they're great. I have a ledger myself and it's very happy with it. It's a cool little device. But when you want to run an app which uses micropayments to incentivize various actors in it, you can't use a hardware wallet for that. The app needs to be loaded with funds and need to be able to spend those. And you don't want to have to type long passphrases with every interaction. Sure. But in the same way that the web was hard to use in the 90s. And they used to say it's only for hackers and drug dealers. I mean, so it's what they're saying now about blockchains. And, you know, they were right then, but you know, you needed to be very technically minded and you need to be technically minded now. One of the things I like is uh, Nick Johnson's project of the Ether cards. So um, are you aware of that? So you get these little printed plastic cards which have a uh, QR code and you can load the cards with funds and if you want to spend them you scratch off the secret and you can load it. People now in the stores that buy gift cards for Amazon or for iTunes. I mean, but it would be nice to have like that kind of a card system. You have to, you can load your decentralized chat app with, you know, reload with like you know five dollars worth of ether or something. That's a nice way of transporting the funds, loading them into the app, and not incurring a huge risk of sacrificing your entire wallet. So maybe that might be an easy way, you know, having like gift card style activation of apps. For Colony, my my personal side of Colony was getting the white paper ready, together with Jack and Alex. And we finally released our white paper this fall in September, so very proud of that. It was a long time coming, but we think it's, it's something we can stand behind. It's actually a real white paper with, I mean, we're, we're not saying we've solved everything and what's written there is how it's going to be implemented. There's a lot of guesswork and a lot of stuff that we'll need to adapt based on you know, feedback from users or just by observ observing how um, the software works. But um, yeah, that was a big milestone that I was closely involved with. I was only involved in the white paper side of things, but the other side actually building the app and making something usable, the, a lot has been happening and our team has grown quite considerably over the last year and we have a beta running. It's not public, which is why we're not that visible and we didn't do a big ICO, so we don't not maybe on everyone's radar, but behind the scenes it's been doing a lot of, there's been a lot of progress and I think in the next year if we do go public with the beta that's going to be exciting because people will see just how much has actually happened. Um, so right now we're going from the first beta to a second. It is still closed and we're very, very mindful of who um, we invite. So a lot of people have written to us saying they want to try it and then we look at what their use case is, what they think Colony is, what we know our beta actually is and trying to see what, uh, um, which ones are a good fit because of course if it's a bad fit they're going to jump off almost instantly and have a negative impression of us. And so we try to find those that have the closest fit and then learn from how they use Colony to, uh, so that we can improve on that. Um, other work of course is now implementing what we've written about in the white paper. So the current beta is still, I don't want to say centralized because the word is overused, but it's hierarchical. You know, you've got administrators and you've got workers and, you know, workers submits to the administrator, the administrator either accepts or doesn't and there's no recourse. So it's like, you know, your boss and the employee. Um, so just to get that task management in, in, interface done, the bounties, the automatic accounting, that is what our beta is already doing and getting to the point where we have a decentralized decision-making mechanism about who should do work and whether their work was good enough and you know, without having an administrator and a worker. That's the hard part and that's sort of the long, that's the long work that, that's up ahead. And yeah, so we're slowly starting to implement bits and pieces of this decentralized version of Colony. We are competing with web services that at first glance appear the same. Task management, there's many sites, many software projects that allow coordination amongst teams and most people who use them, they don't care that it's on a server. They don't care about centralization. They don't even know why it will be better to use Ethereum 
where it is more expensive and slower, right? So we're fighting a lot about the lag in responsiveness to our app. So you don't want to click on an action and have to wait for a block to confirm. So the interface has to be responsive. You have to maybe see what's unconfirmed and then confirmed. That's an interface, um, you know, interface question. But yeah, so the scalability side of Ethereum is not just, you know, can it support 70,000 colonies? It's also, can we make a single colony which is actually really nice and fast and responsive so that people using it won't say, oh, well, this blockchain stuff is worse than the other one because it's so sluggish. Um, and requires crazy passwords that I don't know why I need. And so getting to the point where it's usable, in a, in like nicely usable, and people actually want to use it, um, and not for political reasons because they like decentralization, but because it actually offers them real value. Um, yeah, there's a lot of technical hurdles to make that a reality, and so that's that. Are, those are our challenges.